Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. Well, on tonight's show, Julia Lee of Berman Invest will look at some unusual stocks in the shape of Finios, Andromeda Metals, and a whole lot of other companies she likes, including one I've thrown in called Elders, which a lot of us have forgotten about. Then the CEO of Elmo Software, Danny Lesson, will talk about this stock and why the company's doing so well in October. It did report pretty well, and the stock is actually up 26% since October. October 5. And then we'll be talking to Adam Dawes of Shore and Partners. And he's also going to look at Phineas and Elders and some stocks that UBS really likes at the moment. And they are in the consumer discretionary space. They're not keen on some of the big ones, but some of the smaller ones, they do like it. And finally, Paul Rickard will weigh up investing in banks right now. Which bank really is the good one to be investing in going forward? That's your show. So let's kick off with Julia Lee of Berman Invest. Hi, Julia. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Pete. Now, I, I, I don't like pestering you with unusual companies, but we get pestered with unusual companies now, boom, <laughs> do the Zoom show. So I thought, well, give you a chance to have a crack at it. And apparently, I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Some people quite like this company called Phineos. Yeah, I mean, there's not a huge track record for this company, but essentially it's looking at uh, software and software as a service for the insurance industry. And I guess the thing about the insurance industry is that so many of these insurance companies are still using legacy software, so old systems. So there's a huge scope to upgrade and a growth potential ahead of this company. Now, you may see that this share price has um, fallen quite a lot over the last month. And that's not because of what the company is doing. It looks like a really interesting company with great growth prospects, but it's because of what interest rates are doing. And what's happening is that we have seen interest rates moving up and expectations around Around tapering, which is seeing longer term yields moving up. And what's that, what that's doing to companies which are essentially starting out and that have the, the, the bulk of the growth ahead of, of them, um, what we are seeing is that valuations are coming down. Um, that's probably gone a little bit too far. So although this is quite a small company, still not a huge track record, it is looking interesting at the, these levels. I wouldn't put a huge amount of money into it, but I, I suspect that um, um, interest rates probably have moved too quickly, too fast in the short run, and we'll start to see a bit of a recovery in terms of the share price. But look, an interesting company in an area which is still using a lot of legacy software. So I think the growth potential is certainly there. So, Julie, what about a company like Elders? We were a bit surprised recently at our Boom Doom Zoom show and people asked us about them. Both Paul Rickard and I basically had forgotten about Elders. <laughs> <laughs> what have we missed? Yeah, look, if you have a look at agriculture and farming, um, it's a cyclical industry. And the, look, the cycle's pretty good at the moment. We're not battling bushfires at the moment. We're not battling drought. In fact, rainfall's been pretty good. Um, so things are looking great for farmers. And if you have a look at elders, they look at basically services to the rural industry. Um, the share price, though, is around about $12. I think there's still a, a little bit left there. And the interesting thing about agricultural companies like like this is that they don't report in August, they report in November. So coming into November, we'll be hearing a lot from the, I guess, the rural and the agricultural based businesses. Uh, I noticed that Goldman Sachs has a buyout on it and they just raise their target. So they have a target price just above $15 for a 12 month target. But certainly in that agricultural space, we've been quite interested. The stocks that we have though, include New Farm as well as Instatech Pivot, where we have exposure to the, the farming space because we we think that at the moment the cycle is looking good and it's in an upgrade cycle. Yeah, you have been saying it for, for some weeks, so you're ahead of the curve as always. Let's go and look at some companies that you like right now. Anything that's really grabbed your attention over the past week or two? I guess looking back on September and we did see a, a correction in terms of, of the market, it looks mm -hmm. like that's now behind us. In October, we've seen a real recovery story. And what we have seen is a move into the cyclicals and away from some of those tech companies 
And this week is going to be a big test of that. The reason it's going to be a big test is that over in the US, we're seeing some companies trading at an all-time record high. So these are companies like eBay, like Tesla, like Netflix. But then on the other hand, we're seeing, I guess, a bit of money coming out of some of those popular FANG stocks like uh, Facebook, even Twitter coming under a bit of pressure. And that's because if we have a look at digital content uh, marketing, it has been extremely strong for three quarters. But now we're expecting to see a little bit more of a slowdown. And that's just based on the consumer, I guess, having been very strong, um, but COVID-19 now eating into spending patterns. And that's probably going to be reflected also in the GDP of the US when we get a read um, this week. Um, and that's expected to fall from 6.7% down to 2.8% growth. So altogether, I think that means taking a little bit of money off the table when it comes to big tech companies like R to pay um, and instead looking at some of the cyclical companies and looking at companies that look like value that where the market has uh, probably punished them too far. And one company we find interesting at the moment just because it looks so cheap is IOOF. It's the only pure wealth manager on the market and if you have a look at other wealth platforms like NetWealth and Hub24, they're up about 10% over the past month. I think IOOF has turned a, a corner in the last quarter. We did see investment management flows turning positive. So I think um, it's looking pretty interesting at these prices. And also there's still a bit of volatility in terms of that travel space. We're still accumulating Qantas whenever we do see weakness. Today we saw the share price down around about 2%. So we took that as an opportunity to keep on topping up in little bits. That's exactly what I wrote in the Switzer report today. I thought Qantas is always going to be a nice little buy because I think the enthusiasm for airlines will just build as we start traveling more and more. And I, I think there's more upside. It's interesting that you, you talk about IOOF being a pure wealth play. If they're pure, they will do well. If they're impure, <laughs> as was shown in the Home Royal Commission, then they will struggle. But certainly they may well have turned the corner. It's going to be very interesting to see. Julia Lee, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Well, up now is Adam Dawes of Shore and Partners. Adam, thanks for coming on the program. Yeah, that's okay. How are you going today? I'm going very good. Um, really looking forward to uh, getting back into the office and getting that studio. I've got my builders actually putting that studio together. We might have one inside two or three weeks. Let's hope that happens. Very exciting. Let's not, let's, let's not um, place too much uh, um, hope on builders actually delivering on time because yeah, <laughs> they can let you down for good reasons. They tell me. Let's go to let's go to the stock market now. A couple of questions from uh, our Boom Doom Zoom show. One was a company called Finios. Don't know much about them. What do you guys think? Yeah, we've actually got a buy on this one at Shore and Partners. It's about a five dollar fifteen price target at the moment on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Finios is a, is a it's one of those boring stocks in the tech space. So it doesn't get a lot of airplay like the Zeros or the Wise Techs or anything like that. This is quite a boring stock, but it actually is very interesting because it comes in and takes over uh, big, big, large insurance businesses in the US and uh, creates a dashboard where they can all start to look and see what's happening in the business and taking it from paper-based to digital. So it's actually got some really good uh, um, users and certainly it's a bit boring and it's got a long sales lead time. So the market does struggle with giving it some valuations, but we really like it at Shores. We've got to buy on it. So yeah, pretty happy with the story. I've got a couple of clients in it and they're very happy. Long-term play, it looks, sounds like. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now, another one we asked about elders and both Paul Rico and myself had kind of forgotten about elders. <laughs> um, uh, what's, what's the sure and partners view on elders? Yeah, look, Elders is one of those ones that uh, is just continuing to creep up from, you know, obviously had a very checkered past, mm. but it's a sort of the Macquarie Bank of uh, the agricultural space. Mm. You know, they do a lot of commodity deals. They've got uh, real estate. Uh, they've, you know, they, they sell equipment. You know, there's lots of things that these guys do inside of that agricultural business. And certainly the agricultural business has been doing very well of late due to the fact that we're seeing extended rain or looking to have a good rainy season or summer season this year, which is going to bring a lot of rain up north. Uh, and certainly, look, Elders looks good. It's a good little business. It's 
it's gone through a bit of a checkered past. It seems to have sort of got itself out of that those a uh, fair bit of trouble. And uh, yeah, we really like it. I think it's a good little agricultural play, diversified agricultural play. So you're not just getting into grain, you're just not getting into wheat, you know, those kinds of things. It's a good diversified play for those investors that want to have some agricultural exposure in their portfolio. Okay. While we're in the agricultural space, are there any other companies you guys are giving the thumbs up to? Yeah, so we've been doing a bit of work on Grain Corp at the moment, and we've just been doing some forecasting about those rains coming through for the summer season. And we think there's going to be some bump, bumper crops out there. And so Grain Corp, obviously grain definitely needs water for it to survive. So I think that's a great one. And also the cotton producers as well. NAM is a really good one as well. With extra rain, cops, cotton crops are very, very um, uh, water intense. And if there's lots of water around, they have bumper crops and the cotton price is actually starting on a bit of a tear at the moment. So there's a couple of those uh, agricultural ones that we really like. Yeah, and, and given some of that description from you, clearly you have a very strong agricultural background there. <laughs> Look at my hands. <laughs> I haven't done a hard day's work ever. No, so no. <laughs> I'm so, sitting from my armchair giving yeah, you all this analysis, absolutely. If you, if you came from the bush, you would have been a townie for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, you've, you've also had a bit of a look at, because, you know, consumer discretionary, I guess we we, we know after a, a, a market crash and a bounce back of the big names, value stocks tend to do well for a few years, don't they? And yeah. it seems to me you've looked at some uh, consumer discretionary and they're often value stocks and you've come yeah. up with, what you might call not big names, um, and you've, you've utilised UBS research. And UBS yep. doesn't seem to be keen on the Harvey Normans, the JB Hi-Fi's, the bigger ones, but they do like some of the smaller ones. Let's talk about those right now. Yeah. In the investment, for example, the one made famous by Solomon Liu and uh, yeah. a very good new CEO in Richard Murray of JB Hi-Fi fame. Correct. What, why, do, why do you like and UBS, why they like um, premium investments? Well, they see they see obviously near-term upside in it because you've got the AGM season just around the corner. But they're also talking about the UK. Now, the UK has already been open about three months or two months before us. So there's mm. a bit more of a track record of, a, of sales going into premium investments. So they're definitely saying that the UK opening is certainly one of those ones for that leverage to the upside. Obviously, they talk about management and, how, and, and, as you say, the management is actually second to none. But it's really going to be about uh, the Australian stores but also the overseas, but the Australian stores, how they're performing. And I think that's why they're a little bit hesitant on JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman is they're saying supply disruptions here in Australia and just about to get through the, uh, uh, the lockdown, they still haven't got any numbers of that reopening or that consistent opening for two to three months. So they're a little bit cautious on those AGM stocks, but premier investments, they like that one for some upside uh, potential. Would it be fair to say that if these the big names like Harvey Norman and JB Hi-Fi are negatively affected by supply chain problems, for the longer term investor, there could be a buying opportunity, couldn't there? Because eventually, let's say by the middle of the year, um, when supply is coming, it could be like a, a chance to buy these good stocks at low prices, but you'll have to be patient. Yeah, I think you have to be, but you're absolutely right. Because some of these tech stocks, let's say JB Hi-Fi, not a tech stock, but it does stock a lot of technology uh, inventory, there's chip shortage. And, we, you know, Apple's already talking about how they're going to struggle to get the new iPhone out for Christmas and those kinds of things, which will then definitely affect the JB Hi-Fi's, the Harvey Normans of the world, because if Apple don't have the products, then they can't sell it in their stores. So, you know, this sort of global shortage that's coming around at the moment, that's certainly going to affect them. Obviously, lockdown has affected them. Their online sales have been doing very, very well. And in fact, the, the stock prices are probably fairly well priced at the moment because they have stayed up quite nicely while this lock, second, third lockdown, or for you guys in Melbourne, the fifth lockdown uh, going forward. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and you're taking a, a bit of a, a gambling punt on Star Entertainment, despite yeah, all we think problems <laughs> well they do have a lot of problems but look certainly we um bit of a read through we've got the sydney one uh sydney sydney uh casino opening up again the queensland one might be opening up just a little bit quicker so that's obviously going to give it some give it a big uh, push and then you know you potentially got crown in in the midst of all of this that is going to stay open but 
it potentially won't be trading as 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 much, and so you might see more and more people move to the star side of things. So I think stars being unfairly treated at the moment probably will do in their AGM have some good results and some good outlook as well. There's probably a trade in that one also for that AGM season or period. Certainly one for the gamblers. There we go. That's us in a suit and tie. <laughs> Let's go to an interesting one. Uh, Steadfast Group. Um, a lot of people wouldn't know much about Steadfast. They basically put together a whole lot of ins- uh, insurance brokers, didn't they, and formed themselves a public company, which has done pretty well. It's done really, really well. And, and, and you're absolutely right. It's that roll-up story of bringing these insurance guys in. But one of the things that they've got a cover force acquisition, and I think that's the one that, the, you know, there's sort of growth by acquisition that they've bought over the last sort of six months. I think that is going to then start to really translate into numbers. But as you said, rolling these things up, the organic growth that these guys are getting as well. So I think Steadfast is going to be one of those ones to watch through that uh, AGM period because I think it will report quite well. Okay. Um, and a, there is a, a note here on Medibank Private. Um, is, it, is it a positive note or a negative note? Well, it, it's positive because obviously there's been a couple of reforms from the government that are now starting to sort of see uh, elective surgery starting to come back. Uh, they talk about in this note uh, prosthetic um, arms and, and legs and those kinds of things, and there's going to be a discount for the government to help uh, supplement some of that which is then moving into Medibank and, and people uh, being able to claim on it. So there's some positives there for Medibank. It's a tough one for me, though. I, I sort of feel that the younger generation don't really seem or need to have insurance or don't see that it's important for them to, to have that insurance, um, which, you know, that I, I think they're trying to move that around and trying to get that right. But Medibank is certainly one of those ones that I think uh, is a little bit of a stretch. I think I think it might actually trade sideways from here. I think it's had a it's had a decent run, but it doesn't really uh, get me excited no. uh, on that me, one. That's it's for me sure. an income stock, and I, I, I'm not going to look for too much capital gain there. One yeah. final one on the negative side is IAG Insurance Australia Group. Um, yeah, what, what's the negative view there? Well, there's the problem is 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 that obviously insurance is a tough space to be in, as we just talked about with Medibank, but the, the thing is, is that they've got some ongoing litigation with ASIC hmm. and that has to come out in the AGM and they're going to have to answer some tough questions. And if they can answer them well, I think it should be okay. But I think at the end of the day, that ASIC investigation or the litigation that's going on, I never like getting involved with stocks that have litigation because one, it takes a lot of the director's time away from what they should be doing is running a business extra expenses with all those lawyers that cost a ridiculous amount to defend. And then really it just, yeah, it, it just takes everything away from the business. So if they can get rid of this ASIC uh, litigation and then move forward, I think it'll be okay. But I think there'll be some tough questions to be answered. And I don't think investors will be too happy on that one. All right, Adam, thanks for joining us. See you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks, Peter. Take care. Well, joining us now is the CEO of Elmo Software, Danny Lesson. Danny, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Peter. And it's, it comes after a good week where the market is giving you and your company the thumbs up. Let's kick off with a chart that really shows the Elmo story stock market-wise over the last three or four years. You know, you start off around $2 on this chart, you know, whip up to $8, down a little bit, back, back up near $8, down again during the coronavirus and up near eight dollars and then if you look at the chart and, and i've linked it to you know it could be lots of reasons but one of the, the things i've seen is that when we've gone into lockdown when we've gone into the our economy not f- uh, performing at peak performance or near normalcy uh, the market seems to, to go against the company it, is there, a, is, there a, is there a correlation, Danny, in your mind that the, your company either doesn't do as well during lockdowns and, and implications of the pandemic or, or the market treats you that way and it's not necessarily a reflection of what's going on in the company? Yeah, um, we, we have historically been at a stronger share price um, than we are today. But um, if, if we look at... Uh, uh, our latest set of results, and um, we're looking at annualized recurring revenue coming in at 88.5 million, which is 
61% up on the prior period. If we strip out the acquisitions, and we look at organic growth, that's up 35%. What we're seeing um, is the, uh, the tailwinds behind adoption coming in. Now we did, um, in, in the first set of lockdowns back in, uh, back in 2020, we had some deferral um, in the procurement process in the mid-market, which um, bought our historically high growth rates, which is over 30% on an AAR basis, it bought it back a bit. Um, but now we're seeing, um, despite the fact that we've just been in, in a very severe lockdown in Sydney and Melbourne in the last quarter, we're seeing that organic growth come back to 35% um, on, on the prior period. So, um, yes, historically, um, uh, lockdowns hurt us. What we found in the last, uh, last bit of uh, the final quarter of last financial year and certainly the first quarter of this financial year doesn't matter anymore. Mm. The tailwinds behind adoption are trumping everything and Elmo is back at high growth. So this is really important. And we've always focused, uh, Peter, is on, on the, um, uh, the inline business and long-term shareholder return. My firm belief is that as long as we keep on posting these high growth rates, and we're seeing um, efficiencies come in in terms of our cost ratios, the share price will follow. Okay. Is, is there a, a fair conclusion that when the first pandemic lockdowns happened, that would have shocked a lot of decision makers in businesses around, what are we going to do? And so I, I would have thought there were a lot of freezing up of big decisions. Then when the decision makers said, hang on, looks like we're going to have lockdowns and looks like we're going to have workers working from home longer than we thought, maybe even the hybrid model might become permanent. Then decision makers might have been saying, well, what kind of software, what kind of processes are going to actually help us do business in a new way? The question then is, is your product going to be good for businesses that might have workers working from home? Our, our product's not only good, it's a necessity with um, more disparate ways of working. We've had the remote-based working because of the um, uh, lockdowns, but now most organisations are moving towards a more flexible type of work arrangement. You called it hybrid, and this is the way things are going forward. So there's a reliance on um, software to manage people, process, and pay. So that plays into our domain where we are, and there's this huge um, tailwind behind adoption. So going forward, whether we have lockdowns or we don't have lockdowns, we've got that tailwind behind us. The way companies procure now, they've adapted to procuring um, uh, uh, remotely or with people in different locations. So it is very, very rosy. Um, for particularly human capital management software as a service like Elmo. So there's definitely a tailwind behind adoption. And as we've seen, this is really evident now, is severe lockdown or no severe lockdown, procurement um, works normally, and there is a huge thirst to adopt um, automation because of the new way of working. And this really plays into Elmo's sweet spot. And even more than that, Peter, is whilst we were going through the disruption of COVID and we were going through the economic unknowns um, because of lockdowns, Elmo was investing. We were investing in our product. We were going out, we acquired two great companies in the United Kingdom to increase our product set, to increase um, uh, our view of the market. We, we uh, bought a fit for purpose solution called Breathe which now services small business, small businesses in this quarter that grew at 55% on an AR basis on an annualized revenue, recurring revenue basis compared to last year. So we've invested into the solution because we saw that increasing reliance on the platform. So Elmo's in a very good position. Whilst I can't comment on the share price, what I know is if we if we're growing at this rate and we're starting to see the uh, efficiencies and those cost ratios come through, then we will get rewarded um, in the marketplace ultimately. Okay, so when I, when I initially thought you guys had a future and put you in my Zeke collection of stocks with Zip, 
uh, EML, uh, yourself and uh, Gyro. I, I thought you're going to be reopening trade. I kind of expected you guys to do better in 2022 when the economy reopened up and it would be like normalcy and all that sort of stuff. What you're really saying now is not only, you know, might you be a beneficiary when the world becomes normal again and more people are back in offices and uh, CFOs are more re, re, uh, d- deciding to invest in, in other processes. You're also saying you're now more adaptable for those businesses that can have workers from home. Okay, I get that. But I also looked at those numbers and thought, well, is the UK important in, in terms of the improved results? Because you have invested in two businesses out of the UK. The UK is more back to normal than we are because they're, they're ahead of us on the vaccination uh, curve basis. Has UK um, results helped your overall company results? If we if we look at our company results, we've got um, and and we also segment this in our in our reporting is we have two segments. We have the Alma brand, which is for mid market size organisations. And through acquisition, we have the Breathe brand, which is for small businesses. If we if we look at it, um, we've grown at um, on on an annualized recurring revenue basis, twenty eight percent in this first quarter on the mid market, and we've grown fifty five percent on the small business. So the mid market, most of, most of the um, revenue, most of our sales are in Australia and New Zealand. So yes, the UK has helped because of the small businesses going. Absolutely nuts. There's there's a, a huge tailwind behind adoption by these small businesses, but if we look at that and we look at the potential in the future, we've just launched the small business offering this quarter. Sorry, last quarter in the Q1 in Australia, and we expect that over time to also start contributing. So it's not a phenomenon of just getting great results from the UK. We're getting great results across all regions, and we have enormous potential in terms of um, uh, augmenting our results by launching that small business offering in Australia. So it's, it's a, we're in a really good position. We're in the right field. The, there is an enormous reliance and there's enormous adoption potential of human capital management software as a service um, amongst businesses as they adapt to the new way of working. And um, we've invested heavily there, so in both segments. With the extra geography, we also have increased opportunities of, of really um, pushing, pushing that growth. So it's, it, as I said, um, we've been focused not on the share price, we've been focused on the uh, potential we have in our marketplace and at the rapid adoption. So we're in a really good position for the rest of this financial year and going into FY23 and beyond. And, and the Breathe product, is it going to be taken to market in Australia as the Breathe product or is there some other um, you know, business name that will hook small businesses into its offering? It's been taken to market as, as Breathe. So we were, we're a two-segment and two-brand um, uh, business now. We've got Alma, which is well-established in Australia and New Zealand for, uh, for mid-tier size organisations. And we've just launched the Breathe product under the Breathe brand, uh, which is uh, which is focused on small businesses under 50 employees. It's completely self-service. Um, the go-to-market is digital and partnership-based, and it's a pay-as-you-go type offering. So it really is fit for purpose for those small business users. And we think there's a lot of potential here in Australia. A lot of these small businesses, that's owner-operated businesses, they're doing their people management manually at the moment. So if you think of an owner operator, they might be doing all their leave management around the kitchen table after work. They're wasting a lot of their time and now they can automate it uh, with, with the Breathe offering. And it's also very well priced, it's very pointy. And um, again, the owner operators, small businesses, they have the maturity, they, they deal with a lot of um, uh, B2C um, SaaS offerings. So they, they are literate in terms of utilizing this technology and they have a big appetite for it. We have over 9,000 small businesses using the platform in the United Kingdom. That's growing at 55%. And now we're bringing into Australia, there's enormous potential. All right, Danny, well, good luck with that going forward. And one last thing, uh, 
Last week, I interviewed uh, Bill Evans from Westpac, and he suggested that Australia might grow at 7% in 2022. How good would that be for your business, economic growth of 7%? Well, we've got the, we've got the tailwinds behind adoption of, of our SaaS offering, and now we expect we'll also get those economic tailwinds with an with a, uh, economy really, really firing. That's going to give us even more of a lift. Danny, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Peter. Thanks so much. Well, joining us now is Paul Rickard of the Switzer Report. And Paul's going to be talking about a subject that's really dear to his heart, namely banks. How are you, Paul? Good, thank you, Peter. Now, why do you want to talk about banks now? Reporting season's over. Well, it is for most companies, Peter, but this is bank reporting season. Now, four out of our five largest banks uh, have a balance date of uh, September or March. And so the next week and a half, we're going to hear four-year profit results from ANZ, Westpac and National Australia Bank and a half-year profit result from Macquarie Bank. So this is all going to kick off on Thursday uh, when the ANZ leads off and be over by the following uh, Tuesday week. So uh, big time for banks, bar Commonwealth Bank. Okay. Can you explain in a number of short words why there is a difference with these banks in their reporting time periods? Uh, no, I can't, Peter, apart from the fact that the Commonwealth Bank has a balance date of the 30th of June yeah. and the other three have a balance date of the 30th of September. Yeah. Uh, and I, it goes back decades, Peter. So um, okay, right. I'll leave that to a bank expert. Maybe one of our viewers could uh, could let us know. Yeah, the, the reasons for it rather than um, anything else. Now, Paul, okay. So I guess if, if, if these banks surprise on the upside, it's going to be good for their share price, but if they disappoint, it could be bad for their share price. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get too many disappointments, Peter, because conditions have been fairly benign. I think what the market's going to be looking at is two things. Uh, first of all, just what progress is made in terms of volume growth. Now, trouble with banks, of course, uh, put COVID-19 to one side, Peter, is they haven't been able to grow revenue. And that's very hard when you're not growing volume. So volume growth, particularly in home loans and to a lesser extent business loans, that's really important just to see whether banks are actually are growing the size of their asset base and potentially growing revenue. And the second really important factor, Peter, is going to be uh, just the progress they're making on expenses. So most of them are trying to you know, grow expenses at 0% or even lower. That's hard because of, again, because of COVID-19. So just to see those two factors. So there could be a couple of surprises. I guess the third thing, Peter, and this really only applies to Westpac, is that the other, every other major bank has had some sort of capital action. So CBA has just completed an off-market share buyback. Both the ANZ and, uh, and National Australia Bank currently have on-market share buybacks that are about between 25% and 50% complete. The odd bank out has been Westpac. Now, Westpac has been a fixed bank because it's dealing with a lot of legacy issues. Capital strength is it's pretty strong on a capital basis. Uh, it also has a lot of franking credits. So we could actually end up with a, you know, a surprise um, off-market share buyback from Westpac. Now, some of the analysts think it's likely, some don't. I'm probably on the on the page saying that I think it's a little early because they're still going through some fixed things. It's a bit hard to be returning capital when you're uh, you know, addressing all the problems of the past that Westpac is doing. But look, if that would happen at these results, Peter, that could give the Westpac share price a real boost. Mm. Okay. So looking at the banks, you have recently written a piece where you basically said, if you're going to buy more bank, more banks, you wouldn't be buying CBA, despite the fact that you are a fan of CBA. Just talk us through the, the, the banks other than CBA and which one would you be investing in now before the profit season? Yeah, the one I probably think has got the most momentum is National Australia Bank, Peter. Uh, and it's got momentum on a couple of things. First of all, it has been showing some volume growth, and we saw that with their third quarter trading update. Uh, secondly, I think it's probably the most... Um, Dispose is probably the wrong word, but it's, it, it has the highest concentration of sort of business activities. It's the main lender to SMEs across Australia. Now, they've been hit by COVID, but uh, lockdowns are over, at least in the two major states. And so it probably has the most upside in, in the next 12 months as businesses rebound. So there's uh, probably a good upside there. 
And thirdly, I guess National Australia Bank has also been in the fixed category as like Westpac, but it's running two or three years ahead of Westpac. Ross McEwen was appointed about uh, a couple of years ago as the CEO to uh, really recraft National Australia Bank. I think we're going to start to see some signs that uh, he's really making his mark. Mm. And so I think of the, of the three majors that are due to report, National Australia Bank's got the most upside. Uh, my least preferred bank is ANZ, which is, uh, I guess, it's partly a function of people and personalities, but had the same CEO now there for quite a period of time and not really a lot happening at ANZ. Westpac's a surprise candidate simply because maybe it's over more of its fixed journey than we thought but uh, and the chance for buyback. But I think of the three, uh, ANZ is certainly my, sorry, National Australia Bank is certainly my pick. And it's a fair call to say, Paul, isn't it, that um, all the banks have really, uh, because they've re- reduced their exposure to uh, private wealth, really gone long uh, mortgages. And the mortgage run has been very good for the last two or three years. Now, is putting a bit of a squeeze on that. Now, on the flip side with NAB, as you made the point, uh, lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria couldn't have helped borrowing um, inclinations or or whatever from businesses. So over the next year or two, businesses, as they gain confidence, may well be looking to you know borrow from the bank and NAB should be a, a good beneficiary of that. Yeah, and I think the market sees it. I mean, to be honest, there really isn't that much difference between the banks. They've all got pretty much the same strategy. Uh, they're all very much focused on home lending and, to a lesser extent, businesses. Um, you know, they've all got out of uh, most of their offshore activities. They've all got out of wealth, by and large, Peter. Um, you know, they've really pulled back to their uh, their sort of, you know, their knitting. So there's not really a lot between the two, the, th- the three banks, and even that matter, Commonwealth Bank. I just think it's a question of relative value. And, um, look, there's not, you know, if, 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 if NAB does really well and the price goes up a lot and Westpac, you know, doesn't do so well and the price goes down, I'd probably switch back to Westpac just on value ground. So there's not a lot of difference between them. I think that that's probably the most important point. But if I had to pick, and that's why you probably can just have one because the strategies are identical almost. But uh, if I had to have just one of the three, I think, which is most likely to surprise on the upside and do better, that's National Australia Bank. Okay, easy question. Over the next year, just for I the love little, your easy questions, Peter. Yeah. Always so easy, right? Yeah, for the cautious investor out there, if you bought any of these banks, would you reckon that there's a very good chance with the stronger economy in 2022, with interest rates likely to rise sometime over late 22, 23, that that you could easily get five percent capital growth from any of these banks? And you're throwing a dividend around four or five percent plus franking. Nearly every one of these are going to probably give you about a 10% return in a year. Yeah, look, I, look, I do agree, Peter. I think that they're probably going to give you market performance. And the market really can't go up without the banks going up. So I think that's what you've got to realise. And so yeah. I think, you know, clearly the momentum in the market is still strong. We're still really strong uh, in the US. And we just sort of, to a, mass, to a large extent, following. And in our market, Peter, look, the, 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 the tailwinds um, are reasonably positive. There aren't too many headwinds. So you mentioned the tailwinds. Okay, interest rates more likely to go up. That's actually going to be a positive. Thing. It's not a huge positive, but it's certainly it'll just help improve NIM a little bit. The home market is still strong. Now, we know APRA is sort of clamping down on a couple of things, but just go out there on the weekend, Peter, and see the results for the, the auctions results last weekend. The home market is still gangbusters. So, you know, that's going to help the home lending. Business is more likely to want to borrow because we're coming out of lockdown. The economy is strong. Uh, and most of the regulatory impulse have had the Royal Commission. They've had all the regulation. They've got rid of all their dud performing assets. So there aren't really sort of any regulatory sort of uh, headwinds. So you've got to say the tailwinds are positive. Market needs the banks to go up. Dividends are going to stay at 4 to 5%, which isn't bad. If you think the market can go up 5%, which on the weight of money, on the momentum it can, that probably means around about a 10% return for banks. And I'd say there's not, yeah, there's always risk on this, Peter, because, you know, the market could go the other way. But I don't think there's a huge amount of risk on that statement. Paul Ricard, Switch Report, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. Well, that's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Remember, if you want more in-depth analysis of many of the stocks that we think look good or maybe don't look good, go to the Switzer Report. Try switzerreport.com.au. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you on Thursday night.